Morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening, wherever you are in the space time continuum. This is another week of the Meadows and Makers podcast. My name is Greg. If you guys uh, didn't know me by now, I also go by making stuff on the Steam of Blockchain. And uh, like I said, this is the Meadows and Makers podcast where I like to bring on people that are trying to move into more self reliance situation and trying to bring out some information that is uh, encouraging and inspiring for other people that are looking to go in that same direction so uh so this show's all about that kind of stuff uh just a little housekeeping i have to do up front is that this show is for educational and entertainment purposes only and it does not reflect on msp waves and the wonderful people that uh, keep this broadcast going on the internet our interactive social media broadcasting network we have here and so uh, I see a few few people that have uh, come to hang out in the chat so far. We have uh, Matthew, Matthew's on it, and, or Matthew, <laughs> Anthony, it, or whatever. we got Swoop here. we got Ron Don. Thank you, everybody, for, uh, for coming to hang out today and check out the podcast. Um, another thing that I have uh, on this show is the, a motto that I like to keep in my heart and I like to share with others is that I will be an inextinguishable light of possibilities for myself and others and just to hold that in your heart and try to move in a positive direction every day so I like to share that with you guys so that's something you can hold in your heart and and just uh just keep just remember to keep learning every day move one forward one foot at a time and just uh you know make your world the best it can be so with that being said, I have on returning guest today, a uh, good buddy of mine, Robbie Olson, that uh, uh, we're going to chat a little bit about a variety of topics and uh, and also something that we're working on together uh, for uh, coming up here in the near future. And uh, we're going to get into some of that with you guys and then just kind of have a good conversation. So without further ado, hey, Robbie, how's it going today, man? Uh, going great, man. Just staying dry. Yeah, I hear you. Yeah, well, we've been belted by a bunch of rains here lately, and I know that uh, that you've got some new things going on in your homestead with your your sawmill and everything like that. And uh, how's how's that been going so far? Uh, it's been going good. We've been uh, just sawing a lot of lumber and uh, right now we're sawing stuff to build a 24 by 32 pole barn structure and we're building it all out of white oak. Um, doing an old timey uh, treatment on the wood so that, you know, we can do direct burial and that sort of thing. But um, yeah, what, what is that? You know, what, still, what, I don't, what is that treatment that you're going to do? What it, uh, just road oil and it's, diesel. Uh, is that it's what that huge is? motor oil and huge motor oil and diesel fuel. You mix that together and you paint it on the on the board. And white oak in particular, uh, you know, is already fairly insect resistant. So uh, by adding that to it, it'll be here 50, 60 years at least. So nice. Uh, if if not longer, uh, it wouldn't surprise me if it wasn't here a hundred years. But uh, I I won't be around to see it. So. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. So you don't have to use any concrete or anything. You just go ahead and dig your hole and just bury it in the ground. Dig a hole, just put it in the ground, and uh, it lasts a long time with that white oak, especially these large timbers that we're doing. It takes a long time for those to rot away. All right. And the ground cool. is um, the ground has a lot of clay in it as well, so uh, not a lot of insect activity there already because of the clay, but there is some water. And when you put that oil and diesel treatment on there, it, it shields the exterior of the wood for several years. And then the, the wood itself is fairly resilient. So so it's almost like sealing the end grain of the wood, kind of? Kind of like... Yeah, that's exactly, exactly what it is. We, we seal the end grain of the wood and come up, you know, a couple of feet out of the ground, whatever's going to be buried. And, okay. And it actually has a pretty nice finish. Um, it looks nice. Uh, I'd actually consider just doing the entire pose, but um, we, we might get to that later. We might buy one of those pump sprayers and spray it on, just okay. spray it on there. But 
yeah. it's all going to be enclosed anyway. So uh, there's really no dire need to do that. Now, being out of oak, I don't know, you know, if you, these days you go to buy something, it's all pine. You know, if you go to the box store or the lumber yard. Um, so building a, a building out of oak is something that really just homestead people do. Yeah. For the most part. Yep. Yep. So, so yeah, man. Uh, well, we, were, we had the wood give to us, so uh, why not? You know, I mean, you have people that cut down the trees and say, hey, we want these trees gone. We come and get them and they give them to us for free. We mill it up and there's really no telling how many thousands of dollars in lumber we've, we're saving. So, yeah. And so, you you know, you and uh, yeah, your buddy um, were telling me that uh, that you guys are actually going to get like a whole operation started where you're building that uh, that barn and then you're going to have like a shipping container over there and assembly line kind of thing and all kinds of stuff going on. Yeah, we're going to set up a shipping container for a kiln dryer. And then we're yeah, going to start cool. producing uh, hardwood flooring. So we'll be able to produce hardwood flooring anywhere from an inch and a half all the way up to 10 inch wide planks. Uh, Tony and Groove. And uh, we've already got, we've got several people interested in the hardwood flooring, but we've got to set up the kiln dryer first because you can't do it wet. It'll just shrink. Yeah, yeah, and and you're you're doing that in a cool way. You guys are gonna set up a, a wood stove inside the shipping container, and then that's gonna be used to dry out right. all the wood. Right, all the scrap wood that we have from cutting the timbers out and all the pieces that we need, all the scrap that's generated, will then go into the the wood burner to kiln dry the wood. So, nice. uh, you know, the idea is to have almost no waste. You know, we want to get it down to the minimum waste possible. Yeah. <laughs> That's silly. <laughs> Ron Don Ron Don is just in the chat is just being silly. Said so that sounds like the house that the lesbians built. <laughs> <laughs> the house that the lesbians built, huh? I don't know that I've heard of that. Yeah, me either. <laughs> <laughs> it's like little house on the prairie or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah yeah it'll be cool yeah. it'll be a really cool operation once you guys get that going well what we've discovered too is that um this wood especially these timbers and stuff is a pretty good barter item yeah so uh you know uh not very many people have access to a mill to be able to cut that stuff down and even fewer have access to the wood itself. So, you know, we can provide the wood and have it milled to their spec in exchange for a particular thing. You know, we did that to begin with to have the lot cleared off that we turned into the log lot over there. So yeah, you know, the guy needed, needed oak boards for his trailer to haul his bulldozer. And we swapped him materials for uh, the clearing. Well, we did, we did pay him for his fuel. But other than that, you know, it's just a straight up swap. Yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah, I can't, well, I mean, you know, just seeing, just seeing all the opportunities that have been popping up for you guys. Yeah. A sawmill is like, seems like, you know, one of the really great things to have for a, a homestead. Yeah. It opens up a lot of doors. Um, especially in a homestead situation, uh, you can get a lot of opportunity that you wouldn't have had otherwise. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, anyway, I, you know, I plan on using it uh, on my own house. You know, all my porch material is going to be cut out of it, and then I'm going to use it to build several more barns and use it to clothe in my, the rest of my greenhouse and, um, you know, build structures around this 40 acre piece of property that I bought. If I had to go out and file the materials to do this, I'd have to go out into the world and get one of these nine to five constant jobs, you know, just to pay for the material. Whereas this way, you know, we pay for the uh, mill, but then we don't have to go out and hold down a full-time job because we're saving so much money on the materials 
yeah for the produce that we want to do so right yeah totally yeah it's just a really so, good you know it's a good i'm always looking yeah. for ways to yeah i'm always looking for ways to get out of the grind um because i was a home builder for years and i was stuck in that grind all the way up until 2008 yeah and uh man it was a brutal thing i didn't realize how brutal it was until i decided i needed to get out of it uh, woke up one day and started looking at my finances and realized it was costing me more to go to work every day than what I was making. <laughs> and uh, I said, gee whiz, uh, this is kind of crazy. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of a rare thing that you quit work and save money at the same time. <laughs> uh, so. Yeah, man. Yeah. You know, when you, when anyway, you go. Anyway, the rest is history. I've been, been doing this stuff ever since. So. Yeah, when you do when you do have to go to you do an, um, a nine to five somewhere, there's so many things involved. There's like the maintenance on your vehicle, uh, you know, all that mileage and everything like that. You know, oftentimes maybe you have to go out and get some lunch during the the day or something like that. You know, that costs you, right. you know some money. You know, all all your other expenses and everything just pile up on you. Right, and I was running a business at the time, so. I had employees and all of that stuff. So, you know, I was literally going backwards. I would go to every day that I worked, I spent more than I made. And of course you have some of that that goes on anyway, but uh, when you get to a certain point, you have to say, wait a minute, uh, we got to change directions. And yeah. So, yeah, I mean, anyway. yeah, that's the, you know, uh, I just started a new part-time job and, uh, just to make some extra money for the, the homestead. And, uh, you know, a buddy of mine hooked me up in this prosthetics and orthotics, sh uh, shop there, uh, up in Huntsville. And, um, and you know, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's nice when you're on the homestead to not, I, I can pick up a job like that, you know, if I want to, right. You know, I, I'm not tied to any specific job now, really, because I, I have that, that buffer that on the homestead because uh, I don't have his, all these expenses. I don't have my utilities, you know, I'm doing all my solar and I don't have any, you know, I don't have water bill. I don't have any of that. <clears throat> yeah. I just got my property tax. I got to pay for and then my food and all that kind of you stuff. You don't so. have nearly as much commitment. Right. Right. Yeah. So it really does the lifestyle of homesteading and, and trying to be self-reliant really frees you up to, to do other things too. Or to pick up, you know, you know, pick up work here and there as you at under your own, you know, terms and conditions yeah. or whatever. Well, unfortunately, in our society, we have to have a little bit of money to get by. Uh, yeah. So you know, I have to go out and do things too. I recently did a, a video editing job for a guy just to make some money. I spent about two weeks on that, but uh, you know, unfortunately, that's what it takes these days. So. Yep. 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 For sure. But I'm, I'm trying, uh, everything that I can do to detach myself as much as possible from the system because at some point I think that's going to be necessary. Uh, anybody that's too attached to the system is going to wind up in a world of hurt at some point in the future. I, um, yeah, I totally agree. There's a lot of things in play. Yeah. This so, system as it stands that's, that's right why now, I, I, go ahead. Oh yeah. Uh, you know, the, without getting into the politics and stuff, you know, it's just, it's an unsustainable setup that's going on right now, um, uh, with governments and banks in particular on the debt side of things. And so they're not going to be able to sustain what's going on. And at some point we're going to have problems with it. Uh, and it's going to come back to all of us when it does, when it does have a problem. Yeah. So by being a little more resilient, um, it gives gives people like you and I and the people at Homestead a buffer to be able to weather out the storm, um, things like that. And that's the reason why, in particular, that I was doing aquaponics. And it's because at some point, you know, not if, but when the food trucks stop, you know, I want to be able to walk out here and and pick what I need out of there. And if I, if I need protein, I've got chickens and eggs and fish and that sort of thing. 
Yeah. And it doesn't even get cover the thing about uh, eliminating the processed foods that we get from the box stores or from the trucks. And, uh, yeah. Because you get into all of that stuff with the chemicals and it's really a detriment to our health. So, yeah. So you it, can look at this from know, a multitude of angles. Right. Yeah. You know, I, I was talking to uh, one of my new co workers, uh, was over at, at his house last night. I was uh, chatting with his wife a little bit and we were talking about, you know, growing food and, and, you know, how her family, you know, their, their, their little girl has some allergies and all this stuff. And, uh, you know, we got into a conversation about food and she was saying like, you know, uh, you shop organic and you buy organic food and maybe that's a little better, but like, you know, the only real way is to, is to really grow your own food to know for sure. But then she was like, well, even if you grow your own food still, you may not have all the, the essential minerals and things in the soils that uh that you need for for um that will enrich your body and so you know that we kind of got into that conversation about you know that's why i really like aquaponics is because you know you have a lot of control right. over the mineralization and you know all the inputs into your system exactly. and so exactly so you can tailor yeah, the, uh, that spectrum of minerals too by like you uh can tailor it and that's right you can get in there and, uh, you know, you can add Epsom salt and just a couple of base things and you'll get some recombination going on that uh, will put all of those minerals back in. And then if you want to get into the high detail with the micro minerals, you can add particular types of salts in there and you'll get a casein exchange that will give you the minerals that you need without any of the preservatives, zero preservatives, zero uh, uh, pesticides yeah so i mean that that in itself is is worth doing right right which kind of lead kind of leads into one of the projects that we're uh working on together is uh you develop something called uh the urbanite aquaponics system and you uh develop some plans and stuff so that you could build a a, sm a small aquaponic system like in somebody's backyard so Based right. on, based you know, on everything that you've learned over the years. Yeah, and, and it's scalable too. So once you learn the urbanite, then you can take that information and scale it and make your operation larger. So the idea there is that it gets you set up for not only learning how the aquaponics works, and the fundamentals of it, it gives you a small little grow bed to grow food in, but it also gets you used to working with the fish and setting up later on down the road a breeding system to keep a continuation going of your fish, with, again, without having to depend on a delivery truck. Because that's, uh, that's one of the Achilles heels of our whole society is that the more we get in dependence, uh, into dependence on delivery trucks, the worse we'll be when something happens. And uh, yep. it's a matter of time before something does happen. Whether it's man-made or natural is, is irrelevant. Um, the system is just not going to sustain itself the way it is. And so people that are dependent on the system are gonna suffer the most. Yes. But, yeah, yeah I, the, I agree. Uh, the, the urbanite, the urbanite is really, and it's a small footprint. It takes up about um, uh, about 25 square feet of space. It has a minimal amount of materials in it, and it'll come with a detailed set of instructions. We're going to put together a video on the actual build and accompany that with the, uh, the PDF booklet and. We could do a print off of the thing. Of course, we'll have to do an upcharge for the print off because it just costs money rather than giving, giving the PDF. Anything we can deliver in digital format will be less money. But that's our plans anyway. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. The chat room is just cracking you me get, up a little some, bit. 
Yeah, yeah. Ron, yeah, Ron, Ron, Ron it, it's, it's Ron Don. <laughs> yep. Yeah, so so yeah, this, this is our. What, this, what is he saying? I, I can't see the chat room. Oh, uh, he's just saying that this chat is out of control, man. <laughs> yeah, so he's, <laughs> this is messing with me. Out but, of control. Uh, yep, yep, yep. So so yeah, this is so, yeah. this is a solution. It, you know, it's one of the solutions that I've you know a long while back, probably like 2009, I started looking into aquaponics and how. You know, you could potentially make it into like a closed loop food system where you don't have to take in any external inputs and, and just keep regenerating your, you know, like you're saying, you have your breeder set up and then you have, um, you know, your, your, your food and growing your food and everything like that. Potentially you could, it could be completely self-regenerating and, um, yeah. Using inputs yeah, from you like, you can even take it, uh. Yeah, you could take it up to the, the next level and go into uh, the black soldier fly larvae and feed the fish off of the the waste product that you have from the food. You know, you take the scra table scraps and you feed your chickens with it, and then you put part of the table scraps into a bin and breed these black soldier fly larvae and feed the fish with that. Yeah. So then you have a closed loop, and so all of these minerals are being recycled back through the system constantly. So. Right. Thing. Yep. Yep. So it's just uh, it's just another one of these things that decentralize. In my opinion, you know, we're kind of coming up in, into a time where, you know, we have the ability with technology now. There's a lot of commercial off-the-shelf technology that we could have abundance everywhere if, if we if we only chose to. You know, if we only chose to to start self-governing and start you know having more self-reliance then we could we could create a lot of abundance and decent just decentralize everything is is you know kind of my philosophy which will lead to a more prosperous future i think yeah so yeah it would be uh it wouldn't be that difficult um well people would have to take the initiative to do it uh, i think that people listen to your show are probably a little ahead of the curve on that because they're looking for something down that road. Whereas there's a large segment of the population that don't even know what aquaponics is or don't even have any idea what it would take to homestead or, or live off the land or uh, grow a garden or anything. Yeah, yeah. They can't go to the store and buy a can, uh, you know, they're lost. You know what? I, I saw a funny meme earlier. Uh, I started connecting with more, uh, more anarcho capitalists on Facebook and stuff. And uh, <laughs> somebody put out a meme that said, um, "If you don't have somebody that can sew and all this in, in your tribe or whatever, uh, there's no way that you're gonna build your Viking log house." <laughs> <laughs> like you know yeah. you better have somebody that can sew <laughs> <laughs> that cracked me up <clears throat> oh, man. so uh you know i've got this pdf here we could uh we could show a little bit of that stuff if you wanted me to share some of that yeah um, if you want to get if uh you want to get into a little bit of that and then i have the video that um we're going to use some of the materials from your this from the log that I got from my neighbor for, for this project. Uh, and we brought it over to the sawmill the other day and started to, uh, cut out some lumber. So, uh, step one yeah. of, of building this thing. Yeah. Step one was, uh, uh, this is something that a lot of people wouldn't do either. So you may have to go to the box store to buy your lumber, but, uh, uh, we're we're taking it the hard route and gonna manufacture everything <laughs> yeah <laughs> that we can yeah obviously we won't be able to manufacture pipes and stuff but uh, yeah we we got a uh, anyway. we got a quick question from the audience uh i know it's it's a it's kind of a it's a swoop ass if uh what what your favorite food is <laughs> what my favorite food is yeah 
Oh, God, that's a hard one. Uh, I really like uh, lettuce and tomatoes a lot. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I eat a lot of lettuce and tomatoes. And uh, uh, other than that, after that, it'd probably be bacon. But uh, he doesn't <laughs> like bacon. Yeah, that's what that's a Jim Gaffigan thing is like, you know, uh, uh, spice up your spice up your salad. It become it now becomes a game of where where are the bake where's the bacon? You know, you put the bacon bits in your salad. Where's the bacon? <laughs> uh, I do like now. I do really like the tilapia fish. Yeah, um, they're really tasty boogers. Uh, yeah. So, especially when you wrap them in bacon. No period. <laughs> especially when you wrap them in bacon. Yeah. Put them on some lettuce and wrap them in bacon. Yeah. Man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, having the uh, having the ability to go out there and uh, scoop a fish out and fry that joker up is nice too. So, yeah, we don't do that that often because we we want to keep the fish in the system. But they do reach a certain size when you have to start coloring them out. And uh, yeah, what? Uh, how how big do you let yours get in the system? Maybe like three pounds or so. Yeah, three or four pounds. Uh, you know, when they get about a foot long, a little over a foot long, and we start taking them out because they just take up too much space. And uh, you get uh, two or three hundred fish that are. 14 inches long and a 300 gallon toad, it gets pretty crowded. Right. Yeah. So I don't have one of those big commercial tanks, you know, uh, the whole premise behind everything that I've built here is to try to do it on a shoestring budget. Right. And, uh, to recycle as many materials as possible. Sure. You can go out and you can buy you a thousand dollar fish tank, you know, that's 1500 gallons, but, um, if I can do it with a $75 tote and still grow the food, you know, then that's what I'm going to do. Now I had to entertain the idea of going into a commercial setup at one point, and I may still do that, um, some point and start selling the actual fish and the produce, but I ain't, I'm not anywhere near that right now. Um, uh, I've yeah. got a couple of years of development on the homestead before I can be to where I can completely detached from the grid yeah so um that's first that's what i'm going for first yeah it's it's becoming well i I don't think it's going to be too far away until there's going to be it's going to be a lot easier to get off grid and do kind of like an off-grid setup because uh graphene super capacitors are another thing that are out there now that are uh that's a really exciting way to, you know, for energy right. storage. Have you heard about this new? Go ahead. Yeah. Have you heard about these new solid state batteries? Uh, you sent me a photo. Yeah. You sent me a video on that and I started to watch that. Yeah. It's uh, they don't use, they don't use an electrolyte, yeah, I guess. Used- it uses a glass substrate for the electrolyte, and then they use a sodium-based uh, uh, stuff for the other ends, the anode and cathode. So it's very, very plentiful. It's uh, smaller in size than a lithium ion. has about two and a half times the um, uh, output power and lasts approximately five times longer on the charge. So uh, if they get those things off the ground, man, it's going to revolutionize everything because they're going to be smaller, more powerful, and last longer. Um, Using those particular batteries, they're talking like it will uh, increase the range of a typical electric vehicle to a thousand miles. Yeah, yeah. That would be really cool. So, yeah, well, that those those are, I guess, still in development, but uh, there's yeah. already graphite or graphene supercapacitors that are in that are in production yeah. right now. Um, in production right now, yeah. 
the those uh, solid state batteries are years out. It'll be probably 2025 before they even think about coming out. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, the guy that's developing the thing, the scientist's name, now get this, his name is John B. Goodenough. <laughs> I'm not kidding. That's his name. <laughs> This guy, this this the same guy that developed lithium ion batteries and developed RAM memory. Really, ninety seven years old, and his name is John B. Good enough. <laughs> wow, that's cool. That's 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 interesting. Wow. Yeah, Rondon mm. Rondon says he invented the lithium battery too in nineteen seventy eight. Right. Interesting. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. He, wow. Yeah, so what a dude! Wild stuff. So, but yeah, uh, the the graphene supercapacitors, I would say, is is probably the the best futuristic solution that we have right now, other than the old tried and true lead acid. Um, the thing about the lead acid is the cost and weight and size. Right. Um, yeah. So uh, the uh, super capacitors from what I've seen I've done some experimentation with them they do great but you're going to have to have more of them and they're pricey right now versus the lead acid that's really the reason why they hadn't taken over so yeah I recently watched a video by a guy that I've been following for for a little while he has a uh, he does his own experiments with uh, electromagnetic motors and different designs of electromagnetic oh. motors. And yeah. he created one, uh, his YouTube is quanta magnetics or er, I believe. And, um, let me see if I, let me see if I can share that with the audience here in the chat. But, uh, okay. um, he created a permanent magnet motor and he, is using these graphene supercapacitors now to to partially run the permanent magnet motor and recharge it, and it's it's very you know, interesting. We were doing something similar. We were doing something very similar with our um, uh, Adenia reproduction stuff that we did. Uh, you know, we were doing a battery, but the batteries kept going bad, and then right towards the end of all the experimentation, we wound up with some supercapacitors. And, uh, man, we were able to charge them suckers up pretty quick. I wish we'd have had banks of those things when we were doing our original experimentation versus the batteries. Yeah, so that's what this guy said is that, uh, you know, with the, the capacitors, they're able to accept a, a charge very quickly. And whereas, you know, if you have your batteries... That that's, takes, that's the key. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, the batteries, you'll... You've got a, a curve on the uh, uh, the charge rate of the battery, and it don't matter how much you throw to it, it can only accept at a certain rate. And uh, but now you know you'll get into a situation where you can't charge it as fast as you can discharge it, even though you're putting the energy to it. Right. Yeah. So so with these with these graphene supercapacitors, you can uh, you know build a you know, build your system so that you can take and, and what he's done is he's created a permanent magnet motor that will pretty much run its run itself for the most part off of the, the magnetic, uh, the magnetic repulsion. And then it, that he's got the magnets set up in kind of a Fibonacci spiral. And then when it gets to the very end, the, the magnets get a little closer to each other increasingly. And then you just need that little bit to push it over the edge and the way he's done it is he's he's using a coil and he's created an electromagnet to create that last little repulsion to to keep the thing going and then he's also got a fly yeah. a flywheel and an alternator on the thing uh so that the flywheel also gives you that inertia so once it started then that inertia helps pull it through uh that part as well wow, so that sounds almost identical to what we were doing i'm going to have to show you that research that we had on that uh I mean, it's very close. Who is this guy? Uh, so can you can you share some of the information there? Yeah, here we go. Let me. Uh, we'll share it in this Zoom meeting right now. If I can, uh, let me pull it up on YouTube here. 
So, uh, yeah, the guy, the, the YouTube channel is Quanta Magnetics. This guy's been doing different research for a while now. And, you know, I, I ran in, I ran into his, uh, channel, you know, in, in some of my research and, you know, he recently came out with this and has been, uh, he's actually built a few of these graphene supercapacitor modules that are 73 watt hours, I believe. And then they're, um, uh, they're 16 volts at, uh, I think it's like 16 volts at 2000 farads or something like that. Um, so it's, uh, they're pretty impressive for energy storage. So here we go. Let me pull this up here. I'll share it with you on your screen on Zoom here. So, so you can you can see my screen screen there now. Let's see. Yeah, a soon to be college grad. Yeah, this guy right here. Connect with oh yeah. The key to our dream job. Yeah, we get through the commercials. Um. For the last couple of years. Anyway, this guy right here. I, I have seen this. I have seen this. Yeah. Uh, I know exactly what you're talking about here. And he's got his calculator up here because he was tired of uh, digging for his calculator. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. so anyway, so that's the. Uh... Yeah. It's, uh, it's the same principles as what we were doing. So we had a larger number of magnets. I was. I mean, I was looking for my um, thing here so that I could try to pull up a picture of myself. But uh, um, yeah, I don't know. That's uh, that got me pretty excited about uh, you know some of that that graphene the graphene supercapacitor technology and 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 that is here now to do some interesting you know yeah. energy storage and and. Energy and you know, uh, when you're thinking about homesteading, you're going to have to have some type of energy storage. And uh, if you're just getting into uh, setting this stuff up for the first time, you might want to consider looking into that rather than batteries. If you've got, you know, the money to spend the first time out. Yeah. Uh, I would look into it because the batteries are going to be expensive and, if there's a, there's maintenance the that goes thing. along with the batteries too. You have to, you know, make sure they don't go too cold in temperature is one thing. Right. Uh, and, uh, yeah, you get a larger range out of the capacitors for sure. Right. That's one, that's one advantage of these graphene supercapacitors in my opinion is that they can go down to extreme cold temperatures and still be fine. And, and then you right. don't have, you don't have the threat of, uh, you know, the, the lithium ion of overcharging too, they're not going to blow, you know, they're not going to totally blow up on you or whatever, like, and cause a, yeah. you know, a fire or something like that. Yeah. And that's, uh, in that video I sent you, that's, they talk about that because the dendrites and the lithium ion batteries, uh, you know, the charge and reach, uh, charge cycle causes these dendrites to grow inside the electrolyte. And so to right. short the battery out, if you charge it too fast, the dendrite thing overheats and catches on fire. And, uh, you know, lithium is a fairly volatile substance anyway, in that capacity anyway, used that way. Yeah. Yeah. I've also, I've had a guy work for, you know, we we're talking with one of my buddies, Tyler, I had on the show previously, but, uh, you know, we've been kind of, you know, doing the solar stuff there for a little while together and, you know, we talked to a guy recently that works for public utilities and he was, he was saying that they, they've been setting these lithium battery banks up in these, in these, um, connexes, you know, the shipping containers. And they've had a few that have like massively yeah. burned down and they've had to create new codes for these things because they can't be too close to a building or whatever. Wow. If you're going to install these things, it's got to be X amount of feet away, uh, for the potential of these things right. burning down and, and going out of control. So, yeah, I know when we were doing our plasma research on that other battery machine that we had, 
we could never get our hands on any lithium ion batteries of any size because every engineer was just scared to death was going to explode the thing. But they didn't understand that the plasma would eat away the dendrites, you know, and that's, that was the purpose of it. Uh, uh. Rather than explode the battery, it would actually eat away the dendrites and clean off those plates. But they were like, ah, oh, there's no way, you know, but plasma does some pretty incredible stuff. Yeah. But uh, well, we're drifting a little bit off subject here. Yeah, uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, the energy storage would be something you would want for aquaponics if you're going to set up completely off grid because you're going to need some type of solar and then you're going to need to store that energy to run your pumps because I've said this before, the only Achilles heel that you have out of aquaponics is the pumps. You have to run right. those pumps in order to keep the system going. And so in order to be off grid with it, you would have to have, you know, a solar panel and some means to store the power. And I agree with you. I think uh, if I had it to do over, which I will be starting over, I'm going to explore the avenue of the supercapacitors. Yeah. Yeah. It's an exciting, uh, mm-hmm. exciting yeah. technology to start playing around with. Yeah. yeah. So, so if you, if you combine that with uh, open design systems, open end system design, then you can charge while you're discharging on different banks and that sort of thing instead of having just a solid closed loop and uh, you get away with a lot more. But anyway, uh, if we get back to this urbanite here that we were talking about, it's really designed to show people how to get started with it and to let you observe the fish so that you can learn the behavior of the fish and how the system interacts between the fish and the plants and the mechanical parts of it. Which really the only moving parts, the pump and the waters, but- uh, There's a lot of chemistry uh, and biological processes that's happening, happening in the background. Processes that's happening. Yeah. Right, and while the urbanite book or course itself doesn't get too involved in the chemistry or the biology it does set the stage for you to to understand it and then you can then take the secondary information that we'll be putting out on the the other uh, full-blown bills with the compendium book or the uh the larger book and it goes into a lot more detail on all that stuff we've talked about some of this on this on the show before um, yeah, uh, you know, and we'll probably get into that a lot more detailed as we get into, um, these bills, but, um, really in the thing about this thing is too, is you don't have to have a lot of skill set to put one of these together because the way it's outlined is outlined in such a way that it gives you an exact diagram, an exact cut exactly where to assemble it, how to put it together. And well, I can give you an example here. Let me go to my screen share and let's look at this. If you look right here on this, you see we've got one of the bottom floor systems and it tells you exactly the length, exactly the width right here, cut all joists 26 inches, they're one foot apart. And then it goes into an exact uh, description of how to cut it. And I recommend on this thing, you can nail this together, but if you're not very experienced, use screws, put it together because you're gonna need to adjust things. Yeah. It's a lot easier to pop a screw out. But uh, anyway, then you get the colored diagrams. So let me start out by showing the entire system here after it's constructed. Yeah, so this system uh, is based on all of the, pretty much everything that you've done to over the years to kind of learn the ins and outs of how to build these aquaponic systems and and boil it all down into a, a compact design here. 
Right. It's a compact design. It's designed to have people that have limited space and um, limited experience. So this way, if you build this thing, you're going to have be able to put it in a smaller space. You're going to be able to get your feet wet in the aquaponics and, uh, and not just have a huge outlay in cash or money because if you got to build a large system before you know what you're doing, you'll spend a lot of money learning. Yeah. And uh, so this is really one of those things to kind of keep you from having to do that again. You know, I'm trying to design systems on a shoestring so that you, you could get more people involved because one of my goals, I know yours is as well, is to get as many people decentralized as possible. Yep. In our food supply chain uh because the more people you have in your community that know just a little bit about how to grow their own food the better off you're going to be uh when a situation arises that the shelves are bare at the grocery store um right so you know and it's not really, it's not something that I'm doing trying to get rich or anything like that. And God knows I hadn't made anything off of any of this. Yeah. Uh, so any any cost that'll be out there for somebody to get this is strictly just to cover the cost of producing it. Right. And what we're doing, what we're going to be doing is uh, uh, we're going to be, we're working on this and we're working on putting together a, uh, a workshop, a physical workshop session uh so that people can come and and learn this stuff hands-on and uh building a whole a whole online course system for this stuff so uh that's in the works we're working together to to put that together for everybody right now and and i'll be i'm still working on a lot of stuff on my homestead to be able to to bring people out to my property so that i can host people uh, on site that we, when we build these, uh, in a physical works workshop session. So, so right now we're doing some, uh, we're, we're get, we're working together on filming some of the, the build of building the first, the first one of these. And, um, I recently got to come over and, and actually saw mill some of the, some of the materials for this thing. Uh, at your guys' sawmill recently. Yeah, man, and, throw uh, that up there. Yeah, I can go ahead and, and play that video. Yeah, share that, share that with us. And open that up. So, so this was the the milling of the first uh, pieces of lumber for this thing. Um, we got out there and got on the sawmill and milled yeah, out. Maybe. Some, some of the first pieces of this thing. So. No, I turned down the volume just a little bit because I got. Yeah, you can see it cutting the pickle board now. Um, yep. Yeah, it's loud. Um, yeah, and you're gonna. That's oak right there too that we're cutting. So, I mean, this when you're gonna build yours, it's gonna be durable. <laughs> right right yeah so so this is uh yeah the first step of getting this thing all put together is uh you know some of this material and yeah this is uh you guys were telling me this is some kind of water oak or something like that i was able to get that from my my next door neighbor on my property so uh so there we go yeah yeah no, i'm not a tree expert by any means it um, you know, Lee said it was a water oak. It, uh, it kind of looked like a white oak to me, but, uh, it may have been a water oak, but I do know it was a hard piece of wood. That's for sure. It was difficult to cut. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah. So, so yeah, we got some materials and, and I'm going through, right now and, and coming up with um any anything that we're gonna lack i'll go ahead and and get on order and then uh we'll start building this thing and uh and start filming that yeah, process a so. few things that that we a few things that we can't make ourselves we can't obviously make the buckets or uh, 
the unicellular parts or the plumbing parts, but you know what a buddy you, that, you know what a buddy told me recently is that you can take those uh, Home Depot buckets, those five gallon Home B- Home Depot buckets, and bring them to Lowe's, and Lowe's will exchange you for a brand new Lowe's bucket. <laughs> no matter what condition that Home Depot bucket is in, so <laughs> so I'm probably going to oh, do wow. some of that. <laughs> yeah, they they want that for the advertisement, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, so there you go. There's that that little video there. Let me see if I can. Uh, what do I got to do stop share. Okay, there's stop share. All right. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So there, so there we go. So, um, let me go back to the, the urbanite here and share it on my screen. I don't know if you can put it up large for the audience to see. Um, yeah, yeah, it's in the, it's in the completed. little, it's in the little window there. And if you're, if you're just listening on discord, uh, you can go to mspways.com and, uh, on there, you should be able to see everything that I've got pulled up on my, my video screen here. Um, but otherwise the recording will be out later this evening and you guys can can check out the recording and and you'll be able to see the video there too so yeah so in this image right here you can see that we have two aquariums now these aquariums that i base this off of is i just got on craigslist and found these aquariums for like 25 bucks yeah and uh, you know so you don't have to go buy anything new or anything like that other than maybe the pump and the and the piping but uh, yeah, let me let me navigate to uh, actual picture here of uh, go back one. Might be better just to show these pictures rather than the. Um, rather than the PDF. Yeah, yeah. If you'd like we to show things like. You know, uh, we can go in here and show these these pictures like this, where we show you how to build the bucket system. Uh, you can see here how we're, this is the biofilter tank. We're showing you how to drill the holes out. How to put I'm still just see, I'm still just seeing your PDF up on the screen, so you might have to. Uh, uh, oh, I, I'm sorry. I've got to go back to the the, the you share. Might, you might have to it. stop your share and then have yeah, to go I have to in. Stop the share and then go back to a different chair so yeah, yeah. there you go here you go yeah there you go are you seeing i'm seeing, seeing that okay so right here like this we're seeing the this is the biofilter and even though this is in a five gallon bucket this same principle applies when you do the larger filters filtration systems then you'll use the same technique you know to put everything together uh and the pipe systems. And I'll show you how to cut it, how to install it. Yeah, so it's all it's all pretty much just you know real basic plumbing, and then you know maybe the maybe right. the hardest part of the whole thing maybe uh, actually there's one part where you actually have to cut glass. That may be the the most detailed part of this whole build. Yeah, that's that's the most the hardest part that most people are going to find it. Although I found it was not difficult at all to cut the glass. Um, you just got to do it the right way, right? Me, you just got to do it the right way. I bought this little $15 set of bits, diamond bits off of eBay, and then just put it in my cordless drill. You take some modeling clay and you'll put it on your glass and make a little, like a little raised area and put water in it. It's like a pool. It holds the water. Yeah. And so you just take the, uh, we'll show you in the video how to do that, but you just take your, your bit and your drill and you don't put any weight on it. You just ease it in there and just we cut it real slow and it cuts right through it. So, uh, I was kind of skeptical, you know, when I saw everybody cutting the glass, I thought, man, it can't be that easy because it, it looks like it would be holy crap. You know, how'd you do that? But, uh, it's really not that bad. Yeah, I, I used to work in a you know small research lab, and I actually I had to do some some cutting on quartz. I had to, I had to cut into some quartz at one point in time, and um, and I remember uh, 
I broke uh, I broke a couple of those quartz bits, or not the bits, but uh, used those diamond bits and, you know, shattered some quartz. <laughs> Not knowing oh, what yeah. I not knowing what I was doing in the beginning, you know. Well, now I will say this: uh, trying to cut glass on aquariums. If you try to do it on a ten-gallon aquarium where the glass is real thin, you're not going to cut it. It's going to shatter that glass. Uh, the thick glass does great on those larger aquariums. The small ones, you really have trouble with. So, yeah. If we uh, we go back to this system here, you know, I. I can show it. Now, in here, I actually talk about the the glass cutting at some point in here on this. Yeah, see, there it is. It's it's all in there. So, yeah, we go all the way from the first little bit of it. So here's your. An example of seeing the back of it where you can see the buckets. Basically, all you're doing is coming out of the fish tank into your first solids collection tank, and then the water goes up and over and spills into your biofilter and then dumps out into your grow bed. And then that dumps out and goes down to the bottom aquarium where the pump is located. Water is then recycled back up to the fish tank. So, uh, it's not that difficult. There's some steps that you have to get right or you'll be uh, beating your head against the wall. And we have cutaway images like this. Shows you detailed um, things on how, how to do all of this. What parts to use, where to drill your holes, um, how to find your holes and set it up. You know, the correct procedures that'll save you time for building your biofilters. And little tricks like this right here. When you're going into your unit seal, into your bucket, if you have a sharp edge on that pipe, you'll never get that pipe to push through that unit seal. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and so... You know, you want to take a file or a grinder or something, and, and in the video, and in this case here in the pictures, I have a grinder, a little bench grinder, and I just round the edge of the pipe off so that it'll slip right in. You know, just go into this unit seal right here. See, I'll show it going in. There it is installed. So it's it's really not not that difficult. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's uh so so yeah, we're working on this and uh and getting a website for it and everything like that so that this can uh this information can be uh put out there to you know kind of uh be able to host some some of these physical workshops and there there also be uh we're working together to make some videos and and get them up there to do some online courses and how to build these things. So yeah, just uh, like Robbie was saying, the big goal is to get more people involved in growing their own food and make it easier for them to, you know, to do that on a, on a local level. Right. Uh, you know, and not only that, it's going to give you a lot of health benefits because I know I've talked ad nauseum about how my family had allergy problems. And when we started this aquaponic stuff up, it virtually disappeared. You know, it just went away. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, because we were, we were no longer consuming the uh, preservatives and the pesticides and stuff like that. Right. At least not on the bulk of our fresh foods. Right. Right. And I, I contend too that the mineralization, uh, because the food that you're growing is so rich in the mineral content that it, it helps prevent other problems, even from foods that you can't help getting this process. So, right. Yeah. So, so that kind of, uh, leads to, I know, you know, so, so I've been doing this and, you know, right now I got the greenhouse set up and all that kind of stuff out here. And, uh, I'm starting to, I'm starting to see this like kind of a, 
maybe like a white uh, mildewy substance or something on some of my flowers that are in there. And uh, do you run a fa- do you run a fan in your greenhouse? I guess during the the winter time to make sure the air is circulated. Uh, airflow. Uh, yes, you, you want airflow to move around. Uh, you'll notice on my setup, I deliberately made the, the height way up. Yeah, that's right. And that's because, yeah, you're going to have a lot of humidity and then limited airflow. And so you want to get that humidity up above your, your growing. Otherwise it sits there stagnant. Okay. Uh, if you have a, a situation where you've got a, a like a little caterpillar greenhouse and yep. it's real low, it sets down six feet, seven feet. Yeah. When you're running the aquaponics and even hydroponics in there during the daytime, when that stuff heats up, you'll get a lot of water vapor. That'll, that'll yeah. That's what's been, that's there. what's been happening to me. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So you'll have to, uh, you'll have to ventilate that in the daytime. Now, um, typically, I would, on a system of any kind of uh, greenhouse, I'd advise people to put some type of roll-up sides on it, okay. and then maybe have a, uh, um, a ventilation system going through the length of it, if possible. But okay. at the very least, have it where you can open up doors and, and get some ventilation in, because yeah. that's what's going to cause that, that white powdery mildew. Okay. Gotcha. And, uh, you know, uh, things like squash are notorious for getting that anyway. Yeah. And if you, uh, if you put them in an environment where it's conducive for it, they'll get it even easier. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. But, yeah. That, uh, that's what, that's yeah, something so I got we, going on right now. Yeah. We had not had any problems this year on, on our new stuff. Because yeah, because you built the greenhouse the with a so high, high, with a high ceiling. Very high, yeah, yeah. You know they call it a high tunnel for a reason. It's a uh, you want to get that up there. It it does a lot of benefit for you. It keeps the extreme temperatures up above the plants. It keeps the humidity up and out of the way. Um, so it's just beneficial to make it as tall as you can. If you have a greenhouse environment like that, where it's going to heat up during the day, um, at least that's been my experience. Right, right, yeah. So, yeah, that's something I haven't really factored for. You know, just getting started in the recent years. Um, yeah, yeah, I got. I, there's there's matter, a lot to learn why, in this. It yeah, it wouldn't matter if you were. Yeah, it wouldn't matter if you're doing aquaponics or not. If you've got a caterpillar greenhouse that's low down you're going to have high humidity in there every day when it heats up. Yeah. So ventilation is key. Right. Right. Yep. So yeah, that's one of the lessons learned I've had so far doing this. And, uh, yeah, the th- the reason I, the reason I was doing the caterpillar style greenhouse is it's pretty easy. Uh, it doesn't cost too much to get one of those started. So, um, yeah. yep. If, if you're able to, uh, to get some of this top rail fencing, you can bend it and get a, uh, a real simple greenhouse started. So. Yeah. And even with the, uh, the basic 20 footer, you're still at the top 10 feet. And what you can do is cut off some legs, put those in the ground first and raise it on up another two. Oh yeah. You know, and have all those cut off a level and then you're bending down and putting it to that. Now you're 12 feet up. There you go. And when you get up to that, when you get up to that height, you're really alleviating a lot of problems. Um, I find that you need to be up above eight feet uh, okay. to alleviate some of these problems. You get down, you know, below eight feet where you're eight, six, seven, uh, you're going to have a lot more humidity that's going to be in the general area where the plants are and combine that with low airflow and you're going to have mildew and stuff that's going to develop so okay so if you if you do have a situation where you can't get your the height up then at least rig up a system where you can raise the sides 
or open the ends and ventilate it. Gotcha. Yeah. Good deal. And yeah. So it's, it, it's just a maintenance thing. You have to go out there every day. Uh, if it's raining or it's cold and it's overcast, you won't have to worry about it. But if it's uh, if it's a bright sunny day, then you'll need to ventilate. Gotcha. Yeah, so so speaking of that, you know, you you've set up your greenhouse for the winter now and got in have been working on that and maybe uh I don't uh, did you did you take any pictures and want to show some of that uh that you've been working on? Well, let me let me throw up these uh these pictures I did bring in of this hot water thing that I was working on. Yeah, so you, uh, you, you've you been working on a solar hot water heater, right? Right. And I, there, are, there are a few pictures here of the interior of the greenhouse, so let me just, let me just go to that share. And uh, okay, so what, what we'll do is start out showing this, this old solar water heater that I had built. And it turns out that it had leaks in it. And I just, rather than try to fight the paint and everything on it, I designed a new system using a solid piece of copper that I then coiled up. And what I did is I took the glass off of here. This is a piece of plywood with sheet metal. And then a piece of glass that I salvaged off of a sliding glass door. Ah. And I bought this aluminum frame from eBay, uh, and it's made for, you know, there used to be a craze going on where people would build their own solar panels. Yeah. And you could buy this aluminum channel uh, for the glass. Well, that's what that is. And I had bought that enough to build four solar panels this size. And it turns out building the solar panels was just such a headache that I abandoned that because of the uh, the, the cells are so brittle that you can't get the doggone things to seal down before you break lands and stuff. It's just a extremely tedious process. But what I did is uh, I wound up disassembling this and going to this. And I took this, uh, took the rail off of there that I had and then bought this solid coil of half inch copper put it on there and then well here's some pictures of my greenhouse now you're asking about how the greenhouse was but you can see there's no mildew or anything going on yeah so anyway here's the uh, here's this after it's painted yeah so now you can see that what'll happen What'll happen here is I'll put the, the glass on this and then I don't have this thing tied into the system yet, but once the, it gets tied into the system, I don't have a picture of the glass on it either. There's the glass to the side of it. But once this thing is, uh, is connected in there, I found with the, the old one that I had that had just plastic tubing in here instead of the copper, uh, it would heat up the entire aquaponics system, you know, several degrees over the course of just a few hours, which is saying a lot when you're talking about a couple thousand gallons. Um, I don't know if you've ever tried to heat two or 3,000 gallons, but even running a thousand watt water heater, it'll run for days and won't raise it by just a couple of degrees, especially when it's already cold. Yeah. So with this, you can put you a 30 watt pump in it and just pump the water out of the sump tank through this and back to the system. It'll keep your water at, you know, between 65 and 70 degrees. And then the water itself is a great heat storage medium, you know, what they call a thermal battery. So over the course of, uh, uh, every day it raises the temperature back up and 
then at night time, heat will radiate back out. So it actually helps keep your greenhouse warm as well. Nice. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, that that's, seems like the better way yeah, of doing yeah. it is just creating the coil. So, so did you have to anyway, do anything little, special little there? Like that makes a lot of difference. Did you have to do anything special there? I know some people say they, they fill the coil with sand or something like that to, so they don't get any kinks when they're rolling it up or how, how did that go? Well, no, in this particular case, I didn't have to do that. It was already coiled up in a box when I bought it. And so it was really harder to straighten it out than it was anything else because of the way this is designed. I had to make the long oval shape instead of the round shape. Yeah. So, um, no, it was not, it was not difficult. Uh, I did have to strap it down a lot. I didn't have enough straps and I wound up having to get some of that banding and just tie it down to keep it from moving. Uh, uh-huh. Because you'll put one side down, the other side wants to bend up and that sort of thing. But these, these things, uh, they really work well. <clears throat> and you could use this for hydroponics too, you know, um, or you could use it for just plain old gardening if you had a greenhouse. Yeah, I wonder if you could. Um, yeah, I wonder if you could run it through one of those radiant, uh, you know, heaters where you run a uh, some kind of thing through a coil or whatever, and it blows a fan past it or whatever. So, I know you had what one, you right? Mean? You had one of those big commercial heaters that you hook up, uh, you know, some kind of fluid that you're you're circulating through it or something like that. Uh, well, I've done several things, you know, I had in yeah. my previous setup, I had, I had the copper going around the flue pipe of a wood heater and, uh, that worked well. I was trying to set up a thermal siphon on that one and it worked well, but I didn't have the copper, um, far enough away from the flue before it tied into PVC. And so it, wound up melting off all of my PVC connections. And uh, that wasn't no good because then you got water dumping out. <laughs> uh, uh, it did work. It just, uh, it would melt those pipes and I had it too close. So uh, due to the orientation where I had it set up, I had to abandon that idea because the hand was too close to the source. You know, and I would have had to have another big section of pipe going further away so that the, the heat wouldn't mess with the PVC. Yeah. I had it. What I did is I had the, the tote and I had the drain coming out of the tote tied to the copper and then the copper going straight up to the flue pipe and then it would fill up with water and then as it got hot, it would thermal siphon off and pull more water in off the bottom. At least that was the idea. And uh, now that heat went back down on that pipe and started melting off my doggone ball joint at the bottom of the PVC, at the bottom of the uh, um, tote. Yeah. Said, whoa, 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 this has got to go. Yeah. Because I would have had a real problem if I would let that go, went in the house to eat supper and come out and all the water gushing out of my fish tank. <laughs> that would have been... Uh, it would have been problematic to say the least. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, so it's, uh, yeah, you definitely have to, uh, make sure that you don't have any kind of plastics or anything in there in that kind of system, I guess. Now, are you running, uh, well, you just, yeah. Are, are you going to run that directly into your main fish tank and just uh, exchange the water from there? Or are you going to do like some kind of no, what I call heat to, exchanger or something like I'm that? I'm going to. No, I find it's most effective to pump water out of a sump tank and okay. return it to the sump tank. Oh, so okay. So you're really just heating the water. The sump tank distributes through the entire system. Right. And so when you heat the water to the sump tank, you're heating all of the system at the same time. And it's going to come up evenly instead of maybe too rapidly or something like that. Right. Right. Instead of having one side of it out of balance where the fish tank is sitting over here at 75, but 
the stuff in the grow bed is 40, you know, and then in, in between you might have it 50 degrees in the, uh, in the, uh, the sun. Well, as soon as the sun goes down, then all that heat gets lost out of the fish tank because it just sucks it out through the system. So if you raise it all up at the same time with the, the sump tank, then it acts like a thermal battery and slowly radiates out. Okay. And it, it works like a champ. Cool. Cool. You know, just little little things like that, trial and error, because I did try it going through the fish tank or trying to pump through. I, I said, well, I don't need another pump here, so I'm just going to use the pump that I was feeding the grow bed with and pump it through that, you know. And it don't work nearly as well. It's, uh, you're better off to have a smaller pump that's dedicated to that. And then not only that, but it's a real headache to have to change the pump over all the time. So the way this system is set up is it's got a DC pump. There's a solar panel that's dedicated to this. And when the sun comes up, it supplies power to the DC pump and automatically starts pumping through. Okay. In addition to that, I'm going to have a thermostat inside the solar water panel that has to reach a certain temperature of say 95 before it'll allow the pump to come on. That way on those days where it's overcast, and it's real cold, yeah. the pump's not gonna come on and you're not gonna radiate heat outside. I got you. Yeah. So uh, just uh, basic things like that can save you a lot of headache. And a lot of that stuff's trial and error over the course of 10 years, you know. Uh, right right yeah so so you're not worried about it getting over temperature are you in the in the system with no. a solar heater no i have yet to see anything get over temperature you're just dealing with such a large volume of water now let's take the urbanite we're only going to have 250 gallon tanks that's 100 gallons, two five-gallon tanks, that's 10, and then another 15 gallons in the grow bed. So you got 125 gallons, basically maximum. Now with that system being as small as it is, if I was to take this large solar heater and hook it up to it, then yeah, it might get up too high. It might get up 9,500 degrees in that water temp, which you don't want, you know, but with my systems that I have, let me go back to this share right here. And if you look at this right here, you see these grow beds. Uh, so I've got three grow beds tied in here and I'm dealing with um, about 1500 gallons on one side over here and about a thousand on this side over here. So with that kind of Volume. volume of water yeah i've yet to see that thing overheated i mean it will raise it up and you know when i first started uh trying to heat the water i was using those bucket heaters and they are uh about 500 watts to a thousand watts basically just a hot water heater on a stick you know that they use to heat up buckets It'll heat up a five gallon bucket of water to boiling in 10 minutes. Yeah. But that amount of energy like this. Yeah. And in a system like this, you can run it for 24 hours and not raise the temperature two degrees. Oh, wow. Yeah. So that's not an effective solution energy wise. You know, we're trying to move off grid. So getting this in place of that thousand watt water heater it's more effective it uses a ton less energy and you can set it up to be automatic right and you can go off grid with it so and that's a big part of this is uh being able to grow food in the winter time and if you want to have 365 day production you're going to have to have some way of heating your water. So, and if you, if you want to go off grid, like we're trying to do is, uh, it's good. Yeah. Good to have some kind of yeah. solar water heating system or something like that. 
or some alternative means you need some kind of maybe a wood heater or something like that if you're maybe too far north and you can't collect enough from the sun or it stays too cold for too long uh we're we're down here in the south and we don't have extreme cold temperatures all the time so and then we still have a good amount of sun in the in the winter time still well, that's true now you're going to have different uh variables and different geographical locations you're going to have to deal with so um let me see let me let me throw a share up on this right here because this kind of goes to what we were talking about so here you can see some solar panels yep and then this was before we learned that we had to raise the, the, the high up on these things. You can see the humidity in there. Yeah. I can't see you. Uh, I can't see your pictures on the big screen, I guess. I can. I just see your, your column of pictures okay. there. Okay. Uh, well, dang. Hang on. I'm still getting the hang of this, uh, this Zoom thing. Yeah, so I have to go into another share and do that every time. So here we go. Now then, now you see a large picture. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I see okay, that. Uh... So, see, this one was at my mother's house, and we put up these solar panels uh, just to run DC pumps and things of that nature uh, to feed these grow beds. And this is an intermediate size. This is a. Uh, after I'd been doing it about a year and a half and I had learned a little bit. You can yeah. see how lush this lettuce and stuff is in here. Um, yeah. I wanted to put, yeah, I wanted to put this up here because there are some pictures here of the old plastic um, water heater. And I actually documented this, how I used this plastic to build this water heater. And it's just a sheet of plywood and this plastic piping that you can get at the box store. Uh, it was just one continuous piece. Let me speed on through here. Here you can get a better idea of it. Um, and this one worked good too, and it was not that expensive to build um, because I had salvaged some of the parts for the glass and this, that, and the other. I think I had about a hundred bucks in this. Wow, that's not too bad. But you, there it is under the glass. So this one right here would raise a thousand gallons, two to three degrees in about four to six hours of good sunshine. And so now I'm going with the copper and I have just a preliminary test. The copper seems to be more efficient than this plastic. Um, Yeah, so we got some comments wow. from the audience. Swoop was saying, "I'll stick to the, I'll stick to the grid. I'll use too much electricity." But uh, yeah, that's a good point. I mean, you do realize uh, when you go off grid, and what I've realized is that uh, how much power usage you 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 uh, are used to. You're used to using, yeah, yeah. And you do you do have to conserve some of your some of your power, and that's uh you know, for, for anybody that is considering, uh, putting in a, you know, we're going off grid completely. Um, you want to consider having a generator as a backup source of power that can power your batteries and top them off. If you are going to set up a solar power system of some kind, um, you, you may have long periods wow. without, without the sun or something, and you're going to need some, some way of, uh, topping off your batteries, uh, unless you want to go without power. So it's something you want to consider um, whenever you're going to set up a, some kind of yeah, off-grid you, power uh, system. Well, you've been actually living completely off-grid over there on your homestead for a while now, haven't you? Yep. So I, I would imagine you've, uh, you've ran into some issues with that that you probably didn't anticipate. I know that. Yeah. Every time I've tried to go completely off grid, there's a lot of stuff I ran into. So, yeah, for sure. And, you know, I've realized pretty quick that, <laughs> you know, I don't have as much energy storage in my battery bank as I, as I'd really like, 
you know? And, yeah. and so, um, when you have different charge controller systems, uh, the one I have, <laughs> it's, it's set to, to conserve the battery. So it won't ever let the battery go beyond 80% depth of discharge. And so really when you've, cre- when you're creating your battery bank and thinking about that to conserve your batteries, especially with the, the lead acid batteries, you're only going to use maybe about 20% if you want to keep the battery life, you know, for a long period of time. Uh, yeah. so that, so that, um, you know, you can extend that battery life. And so really you're only using about 20% of your battery bank at any given time. So, so really you have to factor that in with your energy usage and think about, uh, think about that and, um, well, this is a size your, is size your system accordingly. Yeah. This is another argument in support of the graphene supercapacitors because you could deplete those things down a lot further than the batteries and not damage them. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I'm so excited. That's why I'm so excited about that technology is, uh, and, um, yeah. And trying to, and starting to play with some of that and charging schemes and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I think the, the big takeaway of trying to go off grid with solar is that you, find out pretty quick just how dependent you are on things because the first thing that goes is refrigerators and simple heating and air. And, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, yeah. and so once you, once you realize that, Oh crap, you know, I've got to have a solution for this. Then, uh, you start to see just how dependent you are. And right. If we was to have a, a grid down scenario, heaven forbid, where it was down for an extended period of time. I mean, just think about what's going on in California with all these fires and they're cutting the power off for seven, eight days, 10 days at a time. Um, you, you're going to lose everything in your fridge, everything in your freezer. Uh, so even if you had a stockpile of food, what are you, you going to do with it? Yeah, that's you why, know, so. you know, it is vital... It, to me, it is so vitally important that people start thinking about, uh, you know, just, you know, prepare for the worst, but hope for the best, you know, uh, especially in these times right now, you know, there's a lot of, uh, the, the, right now, the, the big story on the news yeah. is, is the dull Trump impeachment whole circus, but you know, there's, there's worldwide, in, <laughs> there's worldwide instability happening right now. You look all over the world, there's, there's big uh, yeah. uprisings happening, you know, pay, you know, start paying attention to some of this. There's financial issues that are going on. I, I really Man, uh, think that people should pay attention. This, uh, the, these, a lot of the, what's on the mainstream is, is a big distraction. It's a distraction. Exactly. Look at what's going on in the background because I mean, while the goat rodeo is in place, they're pushing <laughs> through this new thing on YouTube. And, uh, yeah. Uh, they're using the the thing about the child privacy protection bill as a, a means to put legislation in place that has a lot of ambiguity about it. And while it may be well intentioned on some people's behalf, I guarantee you it's going to be used at some point against dissenting voices. Uh, Absolutely, they're gonna they can it's the language is so ambiguous and so open-ended that all that has to happen is just an accusation be made. And then you've got somebody shut down for whatever reason. And, uh, you know, they're rather than just saying, Oh, you don't have the right to say that they're using these little loophole gimmicks or whatever. Uh, and of course, People can argue that, oh, it was Trump, this, Trump, that. But this stuff's been in place since 2013, at least. Um, actually, it was renewed in 2013. So well, it's been well, for a while. They're just... Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it, the, the silencing of, uh, of anything that opposes the mainstream view has been rolling out uh, uh, wildly. And, you know, it started with Alex Jones. And then some people were like, okay, that's, you know... 
you know, didn't raise such a fuss about it because, you know, sometimes Alex Jones is kind of a, a wild out there guy, but you know, it, it's been rolling out every, it's been well, rolling yeah, out it, everywhere. It, it gets in these ranch, you know? Yeah. yeah. But uh, yeah, it just c- continues but, to be uh, worse. And, and yeah. December 10th, I think is coming up when uh, I think YouTube recently put it because they've been bleeding money recently. Uh, I know, you know, a lot of people in this community on steam it, uh, a lot of people came to steam it because, you know, the, the, what the wide broad, um, censorship that's been happening all over the internet, you know, people getting cut off right. on YouTube and Facebook and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, there's, you know, that's a, the reason why a lot of people, uh, fl- uh, came, came to steam it in, in uh, some of these other options that are out there now for social media, because, yeah. uh, you know, YouTube has been silencing I people. Really, uh, yeah. I'm looking for, any other outlet to put videos and stuff up on right now because YouTube is just they're they're losing their mind and they're gonna they're gonna go the way of the dinosaur for too long because anybody with any kind of real content is gonna go somewhere else because they're not gonna be staring down the face of this litigation. Uh, yeah. So and and the problem that they say they're trying to solve about targeting children is going to make the situation worse because now the people are going to abandon doing anything that has any kind of connotation of a uh, a children's content in favor yeah. of some other content that's not geared towards that younger audience. And it's going to make it so that the children content goes down and the children are now viewing adult content. Right. You know, that's what's going to happen. In my opinion, uh, YouTube's dead. Uh, in my opinion, it's gone. And, uh, yeah. and this legislation is so stupid because it's uh, it should, it should be pushed back against because this is, uh, you know, it's just one of these things that anybody for any reason, they could, they could come out and deem that, you know, you're being misleading with your content or something like that. And anybody that yeah, they don't like, you know. they could just shut off their, their content. <clears throat> well, so. that's it. Uh, the, the language is so open-ended that all you have to do is make an accusation and it shuts the site down. It's right. Effectively silencing whoever is uh, dissenting. Right. And so it's, it's bad enough that they got the AI logarithms, but now they're going to have the AI logarithms on a piece of legislation and not only that, the AI will flag it and they'll go back and look at it. Well, who the heck is determining, you know, oh, well, this has a meme in there and this meme has a, is in a cartoon form. Therefore, it's targeting children. Right. You know. Uh, it, it, could be mis- it could be construed in any way that they wish. So. In any way. In any way they wish. And that's why the language is ambiguous. You know, it's, it's designed that. You'll right. find that a lot of legislation is that way. Um, the people that come out, they try to get these things put into law, but the language is so dang ambiguous. That's the reason why I was vehemently opposed to the NDAA when it came out under Obama, because the language was so ambiguous. Basically, all they got to do is point the finger at you and say, that guy is a terrorist. And then you're you're free from the constitution at that point um yeah so. yeah in my opinion the, the the whole system as it stands now is completely illegitimate and um it should be ignored uh and this is why yeah, i'm so in, of, i'm so uh, into I self-reliance think we're going to a head on some of this stuff yeah yeah and this is why it's going to be vitally important in the future to be self-reliant because this stuff is not going away. It's getting worse. And, uh, I mean, all you got to do is look at this goat rodeo show they got going on up there trying to pretend that that somehow is legal. Um, and it's not that I'm sitting here trying to defend somebody one way or another, but the point is that it sets a precedent because by doing this now, they can just put on this rodeo against whoever they want. And, it doesn't have to be a political figure. And, you know, you could be out here on one of these podcasts talking about something that somebody don't like, and then now you're in the goat rodeo. 
Right. And that's, that's one of the reasons I think it is so important to, to speak out is that, uh, you know, if your silence is your compliance, in my opinion. And so if, if, if you're actually speaking out and, you know, something does happen to you, something like that, then, you know, definitely people can see that and say, man, something really is going on and I need to get involved and I, I can't stand for this. And, and, you know, that gives more validity to what, uh, yeah. you know, a lot of what you're talking about. So, so. What, what was it that, who was it? Was it Benjamin Franklin that said that all, all evil needs is for good men to do nothing? Yeah. Somebody, um, one of them guys, maybe yeah. uh, it might've been Edmund, maybe Edmund Burke said that. I, somebody, somebody have fact check us on that. Yeah. I don't know, yeah, I, I don't, I, yeah, I know the quote though. Yeah. I don't know who it was, but I, I do, I do remember that quote and it stuck with me, you know, uh, yeah, one thing so, the one thing I do I do really enjoy that's happened happened a lot recently is that people are sharing the Epstein didn't kill himself memes. That's <laughs> that's pretty great. Oh, uh, you know, I I I don't know exactly what to think on that. I don't. I'm not sure that he's dead, and if he is, it was an inside thing. But yeah, I don't know if he is or not. More either. than likely, he's not because. Uh, Dave Janda brought out the, the fact that the man probably had multiple dead man switches. And so the, the whole premise that he might be dead is probably false because there would have been all this release of information uh, from his dead man switch if he had been actually killed. Yeah, so I, yeah, it's, it's, it's just uh, one big... Uh, yeah, in my opinion, everything that we're seeing on the mainstream media is kind of a distraction against that, you know, some of these things that are happening, you know, that the, the world is actually run by these these evil sickos that are preying on children and things like that. So, um, yeah. Well, there's another thing going on that's not being covered at all, and it's especially out west, and it's headed by these people that are putting on this goat rodeo. Um uh, What's been going on out in California over the last several decades is they have been bringing in Chinese nationalists into the state under a multitude of different guises, whether it be corporate or UN, and basically giving these people, a uh, these communists, a foothold. So the whole premise behind the Cal Exit deal would be to incite a situation where California would then call for the UN to protect it from the United States government. And that would set up a situation where you would have massive civil unrest. Um, so, and that's not being covered at all uh, by any media. Uh, right now, you got the UN that went into Salt Lake City to the uh, arena there and took over the arena. The city basically gave the UN the arena. They declared it uh, UN sovereign territory. So you can't even, as a citizen of the United States, you can't even go on the property because it doesn't belong to the United States anymore. Yeah, see, see, that? see. This is the you this know? is maybe part of the the bigger agenda. I think is that uh, you know you can't get your own troops to come on your soil and start you know really messing with people, but if they're foreign troops, you know they might not they not they might not be as opposed to bullying Americans around or whatever on U.S. Well, soil. Foreign so. troops won't have any compunction about carrying out an activity against Americans because you know. It's not their citizens, number one. And number two, the people they recruit to do that don't like Americans anyway. You know, they're brainwashed into this uh, communist mindset. So all of this push for socialism stuff is the stepping stone for this kind of activity. And if you want to get further into what I'm talking about, look up Joel Skousen. And look at what he talks about how the, uh, the Chinese um, have been building up a Navy to confront the United States and that these globalist entities are trying to foment a situation where we'll have a confrontation with China. 
uh, uh, he talks about it extensively and he goes back 10 years talking about it. So you can see, go back and look at his stuff. You can say, well, geez, man, he nailed it here and here and here and here and here. And the man knows what he's talking about. And that's right. just one, uh, that's other sources. So, right. So, 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 you know, you know, uh, yeah, you know, one of the kind of realizations that I've kind of come to recently is that, um, you know, may, maybe part of this whole thing is is actually to kind of get people to split off and do their own like small little communities or whatever and things like that. But, uh, you know, it really has to be a whole decentralized movement because if people just kind of yeah. go off and, and, and do these communities but separate themselves from the from the wider society, then it's easier to pick people off in that way. So, so really everything just really has to go back to decentralization. Everybody really has to network yeah, within yeah. their own communities. You have to get into the decent, right. And it's going to, it's going to start with food. Yeah. And start looking into the, uh, the food crops of this last year and how they're anticipating shortages. That's another thing that's not being covered. Um, due to weather events and just other things, we had a significant reduction in this, this year's crop. And it's not being reported at all. Well, that's a big reason why I like to do this show is, is, is to bring people solutions, right? Instead of, you know, there is a yeah. lot, of, there is a lot of this stuff happening, but here are the yeah. solutions that you can empower yourself and actually take this seriously so that, you know, you can, um, you know, prepare for the worst, but hope for the best. And in your steps towards preparation, you are building abundance yeah. in, in your community. So. Right. And you are helping to prevent said situation from arising because the, the whole premise behind that ideology of these globalist people is scarcity. So yeah, they need to keep they, us they, trapped in that mentality. Right. And so if you can create an abundant situation for yourself and your community, then you're placing yourself outside of their control. They don't have nearly as much control over you. They're going to be forced to come in at gunpoint at that point. And uh, that's not going to work. Uh, not the way they think anyway. Yeah. Uh, so just... Uh, just by being active and growing your own food puts a huge dent in the plans of anybody that would be that, that would want to create these situations. Right. Right. And you know, there are, uh, <laughs> there are a lot of people out there that, you know, um, our pay our patriotic type people. I know a lot in my circles around here in the South, you know, they're pay more patriotic type people. And, and in my opinion, a true patriot is somebody that is, is going to be prepared, you know, because they're not, they're not going to be standing in some kind of bread line or something. When the, everything goes down, you're going to be able to take care of yourself. You're going to be able to help take care of other people around you. So, you know, if you're, if you're truly a patriotic type person, then, you know, you should be, um, you should be getting ready. You should be preparing yourself in my opinion. Yeah. And you don't have to, you don't have to take any of our word for it. If you just dig into some of this stuff, you'll see it going on. Uh, it's not being covered by the media. So don't, don't go to CNN looking for it. You're not going to find it. Uh, you don't have to yeah. elsewhere. Literally, but, literally you know, everything that you see on mainstream media is pro the, probably the opposite is true. <laughs> I know yeah, it's, mostly orchestrated uh it's there's little smidges of truth here and there to make it believable but by and large most of it is spin of some sort or nature uh, you know. yeah yeah so i i mean one of the recent things was um I, I i'm a real big fan of this guy brian he does high impact flicks on youtube and uh he recently covered the Las Vegas shooting and pointed out that there was possibly some helicopters in the area. And there's in this, uh, in some people's, in some people's footage, you could see like flares coming around from where these heli these possible helicopters were. So it's like that official story was, yeah. uh, you know, we have, uh, way off. 
Yeah. All you have to do to realize that you got rogue elements running around is to look at what's happening now with, uh, you know, ex-CIA Brennan. You know, they, the CIA is a pretty shady entity, and now they're trying to paint them in a different light with all of this stuff about disclosure and how great the CIA is and all this stuff. But the entire CIA organization was founded off of the dead gum paperclip Not, Nazis. The Nazis, right? And Yeah. yeah and uh, all you got to do is go back and look at the history because the entire organization, I mean all of it, was founded off of people with Nazi idealism. And so... Uh, right from the very get-go and they even took general galen from germany they took his spy apparatus and brought it into the fold of the cia and left it in place in europe so the entire apparatus was nazi all yeah. of it not not you know, even counting the, uh, not even counting the fact of all the german scientists we brought over for nasa and all that at the time so it's like you know, all those scientists were were Nazi scientists, yeah. and they and they kept in they kept right. their, now, that their structure. The scientists that they brought over, all of those went into the um, into the military industrial complex, and because of that, a lot of the idealism got spread throughout the upper echelon of these organizations that are sitting right on top of what everybody sees as far as a legal deal. And down below that, you've got the Congress and everybody else. And so it's just been like a dang virus. And over the last couple of decades, you've had infiltration from socialist and communist idealisms into the DHS and other organizations. So that's why we're seeing all this chaotic crap, because it's by design. Yeah, it's the Hegelian dialectic, the problem, reaction, solution. Hegelian dialectic, yeah, right. So, and it, you know, again, don't take my word for it. Just go back and read history. Yeah. You, do. you know, yep. when they, when Obama brought and founded, got the DHS going, they hired the man that ran the East German Stasi to organize the DHS. They give him five million bucks to come in and, and be an advisor and set up the, the DHS. Now, <clears throat> later on, they hired a bunch of veterans and the veterans are patriotic, but the upper echelon has got that dead gun Stasi mentality. So, you know, this is where all this head buttons going on. I think we've been involved in a covert civil war for years now at the upper levels of the government. They're constantly button heads with each other. Um, well, that's my that's my thing that, that I've kind of come to the realization over time is that is that for us to kind of go forward as humanity, I think that we have to we have to rule ourselves and and get rid of the need for rulers anymore because it's it's yeah. the gov it's the governments that start the wars it's <laughs> it's these people that send other people off to die and in and they're sitting yeah. back in their ivory towers you know and and they're well, look they up the exist term, on a whole nother level. Democide. Yeah. Just, just look at the definition of democide. Uh, because if you, if you go back and look at history, you find that governments have been responsible for 95, 98% of all war related death over the last several hundred years. They even have a term for it it's called democide. Go look it up. Yeah. Yep. So. So I mean that's uh, this is part of the you know. Anyway, coming coming to all this and coming to homesteading yeah. and how it all re interrelates so, is because yeah. you know at <laughs> yeah. you become you become a sovereign of of your own um of your of your land and and you can become you know more more of a. Right. Um, uh, have the have the ability to not be influenced by, you know, governments and and other in these people. Yeah. If you're more self reliant, so these are these are some of the factors that drove me into it. And uh, 
it's not all of it. And I know it might sound all conspiratorial and everything, but you don't even have to get into the government thing to want to do self-reliance and abundance because just the sheer fact that you'll have it for your health and uh, the economic side of it and everything else. Yeah. To me, that's worth doing it. Yeah. Um, you don't have to get into all of this stuff now. Like I said, I believe that we have an unsustainable situation. At some point, we're all going to be subject to a, a just-in-time deliveries, and we're going to have shortages coming on. And I believe that's coming up fairly quick. I mean, I believe that we're probably going to see it in the next couple, two, three years, at least some element of it. It might not be just horrific, but we're probably going to see some elements of it, especially with this uh, – food shortage thing coming up from what I'm understanding uh there's approximately 40 percent of especially corn related and soy related foodstuffs there's a shortage of about 40 percent coming up for this next cycle over the winter so we'll have to see how that plays out uh they may be able to to get it from somewhere else and import it in from India or somewhere else but I know the the midwest had a major crop failure this year. Yeah, that's that's something that is uh, that is interesting that that is possibly going on is is also a solar minimum happening. So, you know, the sun being uh, di- at a diminished level. Oh, yeah, yeah, I could. Uh, like I said, yeah, you don't have to get involved in a political thing because. Go ahead. Man, my internet, my internet's terrible. It keeps going in and out. Uh, so I imagine you're getting some some issues on your side. No, we look but, all good yeah. on my side. Just keep going. Okay. Well, I mean, the solar mineral, that's a, that's a great point. Um, that's another thing that's not being talked about. And again, government tries to explain it away with climate change and uh, bring in some policy that's going to restrict your ability to be sovereign because of solar activity that they're going to try to blame on, on everybody else. I'm not saying for a minute that we're not spitting out a lot of pollution, which we are as a species, and there needs to be something done about that. But the premise that humans have to cut their carbon footprint down to the point to where we're 500 years back uh, or less when the population was about one tenth of what it is now, that should speak volumes to people because how are you going to cut that carbon footprint back down that far without getting rid of a lot of people? Yeah. And, uh, so, you know, the, there's nothing about any of the climate change policies and politics it's going to be beneficial for large groups of people in the long run. Yep. Yep. So yeah, do your own homework on all this stuff guys. And uh, yeah, just don't just take our word for it, but, but do your research and look into some, some of this stuff and, uh, and be hopeful for the future because as humans, we are very abundance creation uh, beings and, and we have the opportunity yeah. to really turn everything around. In my opinion, that uh, it could be fixed it, but a lot of it has exactly. to deal with our mentality and we have to start owning our own power and yeah, becoming we have to, responsible. We have to get away from this. Yeah. We got to get away from this centralization and, and do things for ourselves, not be dependent on these systems. And by doing that, we can throw a huge monkey wrench in any potential problem that's coming down the pipe. Uh, so, and you know, like I said, just the health benefits alone is worth doing, not to mention any of that other stuff. So, yep. And with that, uh, we're coming up on the end of the show, Robbie. If there's anything else that you'd like to leave the audience today, um, I'll give you the last word. And then, uh, and coming up next is Crimson Cloud Steam Wave Saturday. So stay tuned. Stay tuned for well, that. The only thing I can say is that uh, do a little bit of research. Uh, don't just look at a headline and think that's the story. Um, look at history and uh, try to become as, as self-sufficient and abundant and reliant on your own self as possible. 
that'll you'll avoid so much problems by doing that. So that's the only thing I can say. All right, man. I really appreciate your time joining me on the show today and, and taking that time out of your day to come on the show to talk about uh, these topics. And uh, we'll see you guys next week with another Meadows and Makers podcast. And thank you so much for joining. And like I said, stay tuned to Crimson Clad Steam Wave Saturday, where she goes over some of the latest news that's happening in the whole Steam It universe. And, uh, and always great information. So stay tuned for that. And we will, uh, we'll catch you guys next time. And so thanks again for hanging out with me on an, another episode of the Meadows and Makers podcast. Play you awake with Awake by Divine and Junk Feathers. So catch you guys later.